Good morning. Wasn't that great? Thank you, Lisa. Boy, her feet were just running on those pedals down there this morning. <laughs> it is good to be together with you all. Uh, some of you are joining us virtually, and we have, uh, for the first time in many, many weeks, gathered together here in the, in the sanctuary. Even though we're in different places, we are all united by our desire to worship God. If you are with us online today, please uh, let us know that you're in worship. The link to our online contact card is found in the Facebook and YouTube posts. And if you are here, we are taking note and, and we'll mark you present. A uh, couple of announcements. Our prayer group is tomorrow, April 19th, Monday at 1 p.m., and that's by Zoom. Also on Monday at 2 p.m., Bible study is going to meet again by Zoom. We are doing our second week of an overview of the Jewish faith. Uh, special study, and this is not just for people who are traditionally in our Bible study. We are starting a book study on the book Good Morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, Getting Through Your Grief. Now, a little caution here. I saw that the psychic Teresa Caputo also has a book called Good Morning, but that's not the one that we're studying. Uh, our book is by Alan Cole, and the cover does not feature Ms. Caputo in her pink sweater. If you'd like to participate, please let me know. We've still got time to order your book, and uh, we can order it for you, or you can order it yourself on Amazon. Following worship today, I'm going to ask everyone to actually stay seated for, or, or take your seat for the prelude, and then we have a congregational meeting that will, uh, will happen immediately after that. Our members are invited to remain. Please rise, either in body or in spirit, as I welcome you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please join me in the call to worship. Once there was sadness. Now we are clothed with Easter joy. Once there was mourning. Now there is a possibility of rejoicing. Once there were tears and silence. Now laughter has returned and the music of praise. Once there were hunger and longing. Now we are gathered in Christ's kingdom and fed with love. be seated. Prayer is one of the spiritual disciplines that we rely on most to try to connect with God. It is two-way communication at its very best. As a community in Christ, every Sunday we pray together for each other and also for the world. So as I offer each prayer this morning, I will say, God, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Now, we may be a little out of practice, so God, in your mercy, hear our Wonderful. What have you brought with you this morning? 
Are there prayer concerns that you'd like to lift up? I have a, a couple. For the family of Judy Petcher, Judy passed from this life to the next last or this week. Through her work in hospice, she cared for so many people in our community. So we lift up her family and her friends. God in your mercy. Also, for the increasing number of people who in recent months have been driven out of their homes. I've seen them on the streets in tents along the roadside in Tulsa this weekend in Kansas City. And yes, even in Bartlesville. May they find safety and may we seek other opportunities to help them, not only in our donations, but also by raising our voices. Please bow with me as we continue in prayer. God of resurrection and new life, open our minds and hearts to the world around us that we may experience your good creation anew. We rise this morning in praise and we bow our heads in prayer at the life-giving and life-changing, world-shattering power of your love. On this Earth Day Sunday, help us to become better stewards of your land and its resources. Make us receptive to the sacrifices that we sometimes need to make to sustain life on our beautiful planet. We ask also for healing for the hurting, body, mind, spirit. Comfort the family of Judy Petcher as they mourn her passing. And finally, today, we pray for this congregation. This community formed so many years ago in the name of Christ and for your glory. God, you have blessed this congregation abundantly, and we humbly and with a grateful spirit ask for your guidance today. We ask these things in the name of your son Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Steve. There is no peace like that peace that Jesus gives us. He does give us peace like a river. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 36b through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said that, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. May God add blessing to the reading and also to the hearing of these words of scripture. I believe that every Christian should live for those moments of the unexpected. We plan our lives so well. We schedule almost everything from the jolt of our alarm clocks until we sigh in relief as our bodies hit the soft bed. Many of our days are very, very routine. But some days, the unexpected happens, and it throws us off track. It surprises us. These are days like the one that I had when five-foot-tall Lorenza Andrade Smith walked barefoot into my life. When suddenly your schedule doesn't seem as important after all. Time stops for the unexpected. and God is near, we are transformed, convicted, and called. Now I'll tell you more about Lorenza in just a moment. Two weeks ago, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And then last week, we began to think about what resurrection living would look like for the disciples and what it could look like for us. Now, in our reading from Luke this morning, we see Jesus standing before the disciples as ever the patient teacher leading them. And he wanted three things from them and for them. For them to be transformed, convicted, and called. 
peace be with you, Jesus said. Shalom. This is a routine greeting for people in this part of the world, but this time it took on a different tone. That word peace had to stand out for the disciples. There was anything but peace in their souls after Jesus' death. Yet here Jesus was, in that very room amongst them, standing in their midst. The disciples thought that they were seeing a ghost. I think that's a natural reaction. And Jesus understood that they needed an explanation or context. They needed, as we often need, some extra visuals, a little proof, particularly at life-altering moments, something to move us from fear and being stuck in shock and disbelief so that we can embrace possibility. Jesus said, look at my hands and my feet. See, it is I myself. And the disciples, they gingerly touched his flesh. He was really there. But still, Luke writes, while in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. So Jesus then go, really goes the extra mile and asks, have you anything to eat? How odd. Have you anything to eat? Not only do real people have bodies that you can see and feel and touch, but they have needs, basic needs like eating and sleeping, having water. And Jesus showed them that he was real. He had been transformed, yes, but human and embodied, resurrected, not simply resuscitated. A few moments ago, I mentioned Lorenza Andrade Smith. She's actually the Reverend Andrade Smith. This woman is a walking and talking sermon, definitely human and completely embodied, but one who has been transformed and one who helps to transform others. A few years ago, at a conference in Tulsa, Reverend Andrade Smith engaged in worship and conversation and hospitality with our community and also with people from the specific community that she served. You see, Lorenza's primary ministry was with the homeless, the poor, the migrants, and others who found themselves without a voice in our world. I admit I can be a little cynical sometimes. Not knowing Lorenza, I wondered if I was going to find a wild-eyed radical or maybe an out-of-touch dreamer. But what I saw was neither one of those things. And over the course of our time together, I was transformed. Lorenza Andrade Smith was a United Methodist minister until she retired from ministry last August. And she had a very unusual ministry. What is unique about it was that Lorenza had persuaded her bishop in San Antonio, Texas, to appoint her for three whole years as a minister to the people on the streets. Not to a church, not to a chaplaincy, and not to an organization. To the people on the streets. And that is where Lorenza lived as well, on the streets. That is where she ministered. She carried no money, only donated food cards, and she lived in solidarity, in solidarity with the people that she served. Although I greatly admire what Lorenza did, I would have to say to most people, don't try this at home. It was risky and very challenging, but Lorenza was an Air Force veteran. She knew how to handle herself in difficult situations besides her, in spite of her petite size. Lorenza approached this ministry with presence and patience and gentleness much like Jesus of the gospel that she proclaimed. Just before coming to Tulsa, Lorenza had been put in a county jail in San Antonio for sleeping on the street. She tried to go to a shelter, but the shelter wouldn't let her bring her chalice and patten. These are the things that she used for communion. The shelter was afraid that they might be used as a weapon. So chalice and patten by her side she slept on the street, and she suffered the consequences. 
While Lorenza was in that county jail, though, her ministry continued. She experienced what it meant to be embodied when you are poor and homeless and locked up. She was placed in a room of 40 bunks, all the way at the back of the room. It was nighttime, and everyone else was watching TV. They were watching a news report. Lorenzo was surprised at how very quiet the room was with those 40 women until she realized that what they were watching was a report about Lorenzo's arrest. When the guard realized what was happening, they quickly moved her to the front of the room for her own safety. As the night went on, Lorenzo needed to go to the restroom, as we all do. The toilets were all in a row, and they were exposed. There was no privacy. Lorenzo waited as long as she could until she got up the courage to go over. Then a woman approached her, taking a seat immediately next to Lorenza, and she asked her, will you pray for me? And Lorenza thought, really, God, right now? But ministers, we're taught to pray whenever and wherever people need us to and where, where they want us to. Having been interrupted from her business, Lorenza went, Lorenza went back to the toilet for a second time. Another woman came and sat right next to her. Lorenza stopped what she was doing again, prayed for the woman, and went back to her bunk. But when you go, when you have to go, you have to go. So she went back a third time, and you guessed it. Another woman came asking her for prayer. This time she had no choice. Lorenza said she finally had to pray with the woman while she actually used the facilities. This was a first for Lorenza. Later she found out why. She found out that the women were not allowed to talk to each other except in two places, at the toilets and in the day room. And the day room had been closed for the night. The jail staff found out what was happening, and they eventually attached an envelope to Lorenza's bunk so that people could drop prayer requests in as they went by her bunk. I think from these stories, you can begin to see why I was transformed that day. It was her presence and her words. Jesus said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Everything in the Torah, everything, the law, the prophets, and the writings, A to Z. Jesus was a new thing, but yet he was not. He was built on the foundation of his faith. He was a part of God's plan that had been set in motion with the creation of the world. And by sending Jesus to earth, flesh and blood, God reaffirmed to us that our humanness, our bone and sinew and marrow, everything that makes us human is not bad. We are not disembodied souls. God said that it was very, very good. And Jesus was surely transformed as he was raised, but the disciples could still see his humanness in his body and in the eating of the fish. Resurrection is transformation. It is making something new out of something old. That day that I met Lorenza, I was transformed. But it went further than that. I was also convicted. In the evening of that conference, some 100 people, some of them were homeless, some were poor, some were privileged like me. We all ate together at St. Mark's United Methodist Church. It's uh, their weekly manna meal, like manna from heaven. It was a place where individuals with homes and without homes could meet together, relate to each other, eat and talk. As I looked for a place to sit down, I saw what I thought was an open space, but it wasn't really open. Looking down there on the floor where a chair should have been, I saw a baby with large blue doll eyes 
she was beautiful and she was looking up at me from her carrier, but I didn't expect to see a baby when I tried to sit down there. Oh, I said, and the baby's mother, who was right next to her, she laughed at me. And she, Mom was in her mid-20s and she said, that's my daughter, just love in her voice. I, I recovered, I oohed and awed over the baby, over her sparkling eyes, and the mom added, most people think she's a boy because I dress her in this blue outfit, but she likes it. It keeps her warm. The temperature that day was 78 degrees. I wondered why in the world would she need to keep that baby warm? And then I remembered. Nights spent outside can be chilly, downright cold, even on warm days. And I had been convicted. After dinner, this young woman, this young mom, sat down very timidly at a stool at the front of the room, and she began to tell her story. I hadn't realized that she was going to be one of the speakers. She told of being kicked out of her home as a young teen, living on her own, becoming pregnant, moving in with a sister who eventually grew tired of her and asked her to leave. And moving on to Tulsa, she found love. She met her new husband who was staying in the same shelter. Together, they had created that beautiful little baby girl. And now, she said, there was another one on the way. Judgment crept into my mind like a black, thick fog. I thought, pregnant and homeless? Twice? And I was convicted again. A colleague of mine who was also there wrote this in her blog after hearing the woman speak. She wrote, I listened, teared up, and walked away with a heavy heart. Her blog post bravely went on. To find my footsteps with Jesus, I'm reminded of this scripture. We should stop judging one another. Judge rather that you should not put anything before your brother or sister to make them stumble or fall. That's Romans chapter 14, verse 13. And my colleague ended the post with the words, might I be convicted of compassion rather than judgment. The two of us, along with many others in the room, were convicted. And if we truly believe and try to live our faith, all of us, in the course of our lives, we are going to be convicted over and over again. We're going to be convicted for being too busy, for looking the other way, for hoarding our love, our life, our resources, even the gospel. As Christians, we are transformed. God has made sure that that has happened to us. We are a transformed people, and yet we are still convicted in our weakness. But God is not going to leave us there. God is not going to allow us to wallow in pity over how imperfect we are. Our new life in Christ calls us, convicted as we are, to our ministry of witness and service. Jesus reminded the disciples the very last verse that we read today, you are witnesses of these things. Jesus was leaving them this time for good, and the torch was being passed. You are witnesses of these things. Jesus' entire life had been a lesson. His teaching, his preaching, his ministering, his healing, crucifixion, resurrection, in the way that he treated other people, in the way that he worked for the healing of the world, in the way that he was willing to do whatever it took to reconcile us with each other and with God, even to the point of dying because of the hatred of the world. The disciples and we are called to witness to, to all of that, to all of what Jesus was. The things that I witnessed that one single day, the presence of a barefoot minister, a beautiful young mom who also happened to be homeless, those were powerful reminders to me. I am transformed. 
and I am frequently convicted, and I am called. I have work to do on myself, and I have a calling to fulfill in this world. We have to work on ourselves, and we have, all of us, a calling to fulfill in this world. Are your eyes open? Is your heart open? What have you witnessed that's changed you? What will you witness that will change you? We are the transformed people of God through Jesus Christ, whom we have accepted as our Lord and Savior. And if we are going to be faithful, we will continue to evolve in our faith, never stop growing, no matter how old we are or how long we've been a Christian. We are transformed. We are convicted. And we are called. Amen. Jesus said, peace be with you. But it wasn't quite okay yet for the disciples. So Jesus showed him his hands. That helped a little bit. They felt a little more at ease with their risen Savior. And then Jesus brought it home. He began teaching as he always did with authority and insight. So all of Jesus' complex teaching, all of his parables that confuse and befuddle us sometimes, those can all be boiled down to two things to love of God, and to love of neighbor. In our offering that we collect each week, we fulfill both of those things, love of God and love of neighbor. Please stand as we dedicate our tithes and offering to do the work in the world of God's love. In our lectionary epistle for the day, 1 John chapter 3 begins, See what love the Father has given us, and we, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The author of this letter was reminding the church how much God loves them and that they were God's children. We are God's children. We bear the resemblance of God and we share in God's inheritance. And so we are called around this table. It's God's family table. At the invitation of the Son, Jesus Christ, we find the bread, we find the cup, but also joy, peace, and our salvation. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, as we prepare to participate in this communion table through the sharing of the bread and cup, Help each of us to look back and remember Christ's death for us on the cross. To look up and know that the risen Savior is among us. To look around and rejoice in our fellowship with one another. And to look forward in hope to the coming of your kingdom and the fulfillment of your promise of salvation and victory over death for all who believe and accept Christ as their Savior. In his name we pray. On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread. And giving thanks to God, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, Jesus took a cup. He poured it, 
he blessed it. And giving thanks to God once more, he said, this cup is the covenant in my blood renewed. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me until I come again. You are invited to Jesus' table. He invites all of us. May you come with thanksgiving and joy and love in your heart. Quick reminder, don't run off after the prelude. I'm also going to invite you to stand now for, your benedic for the benediction and then to be seated for the prelude. Allow God to transform you. Welcome those times when you are convicted and learn from them. And may the Holy Spirit move you to accept God's call on your life. Go in peace. You are blessed children of God. Amen. Amen.